guys, what's going on? Welcome to Serial at Midnight. My name is Heath, and this is a very special video because I am joined by Barrett Evans from Mill Creek Entertainment. Barrett, welcome to Serial at Midnight. Thank you, Heath. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So you are um, like a 15-year veteran of of like product development and marketing in the entertainment sphere. Is that fair to say? That is definitely fair to say, yes. What, um, I'm looking at my notes here. You're, I want to get your specific, you were the vice president of marketing for Mill Creek Entertainment. That's correct. Yep. Can you, can you tell us kind of what that's, what does that entail? Mm, entails a lot. It's uh, obviously very broad, but basically from the moment that um, a deal comes to fruition and um, to the point where the product ends up on shelf, um, pretty much everything in between is under at least my my supervision. So I uh, manage the graphic design team, uh, the product development process, um, anything social media related. Um, if we produce special features, that kind of falls under at least my umbrella. So, I mean, we're a pretty small operation. We're lean and mean, and so we all wear a lot of hats. But when it comes to the product itself and how it gets to market, um, most of that comes under m me and my team. Awesome. So... One of the things that I wanted to talk about is that you worked for BCI Eclipse I did, for, yes. for several years. Those were like the glory days, you know, like 2005, 2006. Oh, yeah. It's like the glory days of physical media, where like DVDs, where like you go into any big box store and they were just like towering, towering shelves of media. Um, and you were there. You were like boots yeah. on the ground helping to develop some of that stuff. BCI Eclipse is a company that so many – of my generation of physical media fans, um, like we think of it so fondly because like there was the filmation license, right? Yes. Uh, yes. So I, I mean, I have to show these are visual references. You, the He Man, He Man, uh, and the Masters of the Universe. Yeah. Um, this is you guys. This is VCI Eclipse. Did you have any involvement in the development of these? Every bit of it. Absolutely. Um, every step of the way. That it? was yeah. that was quite the three year long labor of love. No doubt about that. Um, so yeah, so I was out at BCI. Um, so my long-term friend, coworker, colleague, uh, Jeff Hain, and I have both been at BCI and then eventually transitioned over to Mill Creek. Slightly different timelines for each of us, but the two of us have been through it all, have been seeing everything happen um, on the independent home media front, um, and have struggled and persevered and, and done some pretty cool things, I think, throughout our careers. Uh, but yeah, but so he was instrumental in landing the deal. He's our SVP um, here at Mill Creek, and he does all the acquisitions and the licensing and the deal making. And so together, the two of us are really side by side, hand in hand, in in both what do we, what kind of properties do we want to seek, um, what do we want to go after. And the day he started at BCI, he was like, I want He Man. And and that was his like single pursuit. And he called the rights holders pretty much daily um if not hourly um to try to score a deal and eventually it came to fruition and then it wasn't just he-man it was the entire filmation library um so it was it was pretty epic and like you said it was definitely the hate the heyday oh yeah brace it's are. a visual aid so just hold them up <laughs> perfect um but you know we were we took it very seriously we knew that this was introducing the property to home home media for the first time we didn't want to just do it we wanted to do it right and so we, we gathered together a group of probably a dozen or so experts in the field, whether it would be the, the folks over who are operating He-Man.org or the illustrators. And then Lou Scheimer himself was involved in getting everything together. I think in totality, we, we, we produced around 50 hours of special features throughout the entire Filmation library. Uh, we interviewed... In a three-week span, we had 83 people who were associated with Filmation or the fan community come together. We rented out a studio for, for three weeks, and it was just this nonstop, 10 hours a day, rotation of getting people um, on camera, doing commentaries, uh, doing photos, and, and, and miscellaneous. But yeah, I think it was like 80-some people throughout that three-week, uh, just this nonstop rotation of getting special features produced. And it was amazing, right? It was a yeah. truly a labor of love, and but um, yeah, it was very consuming, but very proud of it. And those special features, like they're fantastic. I love those, and I don't think, 
Um, you know, like Universal put uh, they put out their own version of He-Man and the Masters of the Universe last year, I think. And yep. most of those, if not all of those, are of course not there. Um, right. And those are still like the best special features for He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. The art cards and everything. My goodness. Yeah. But see, this is there, there's a tie in here because of course at Mill Creek, you and Jeff at Mill Creek. Um, you guys were able to bring some of those relationships over yeah. with you, and yeah. much of the filmation catalog. Like here, I, I held up Brave Star, so like here's a uh, the BCI, I believe Brave Star, and then you guys have your own. You did put out yeah. Brave Star yourselves, so um, I'm I'm wondering how much of this stuff is just you guys being fans of this stuff and <laughs> wanting to you know wanting to represent it wherever you're at. Can you speak to that? Uh, definitely. Um, there's no doubt that there's a lot of self-indulgent and self-interest <laughs> involved in some of the titles that get acquired. Uh, Legend of Billie Jean over my shoulder, uh, definitely one of those pursuits. It was like one of those films that I was like, okay, every summer of my childhood that was in nonstop rotation on HBO and I want to see this br brought out on physical media. Yeah. And Sony, of course, had it um, on DVD. And we were interested in trying to get the Blu-ray rights. So, like when we did our first uh, license, uh, library license deal with Sony, I was kind of ridiculously adamant to make sure that it was part of the deal. And they were like, "Why? Why? Why do you care so much about this movie?" And I'm like, "Just wait, just see. I know that there's fans out there. Yeah, I'm not alone in this <laughs> and wanting to have own this. Um, so you know, it's it's definitely." Um, where our passions lie, we pay a ton of attention to forums and, and watching what people are wanting and looking for. And so we'll do our best to pursue them and, and bring them to bring them to the market as best we can with a nice balance of fan sensibility as well as retail friendliness. Um, yeah. It's always a struggle that, that we have as an independent studio because we want to cater to both. But we can only, we can only invest so much um, to make it financially viable and lucrative and, and to have, make it make sense. So I think, you know, we we love what our competitors and our colleagues in, in the, who are working in the same space, and we try to do right by our fans, but at the same time, we, we have a retailer that we need to support, yeah. and we have... Um, you know, we have we have lots of objectives. I mean, you see our, how diverse our catalog is. And so we kind of, you know, we're not a one trick pony. Like we will release the same piece of content in multiple different ways to try to appease all sorts of fans, whether it's the mm -hmm. casual fan or it's a diehard enthusiast. So there's, a, there's so many different directions I could go from there. Um, when you came in, so... Mill Creek Entertainment started uh, 2002, I believe, and you've been there for over a decade, right? I've been there for 11 years, yeah. Yeah, so your your tenure there kind of coincides with what I see as a boom and a, a changing of the model right. uh, towards more licensing, more – like I, you, you know, the deal with Sony, you guys have to deal with uh, Universal, with um, – oh, the, um, the, the Andy Sedaris movies. You know, there's so many nice. different things – that have come in uh, during the last few years. One of the things that I continue to see is that so many of the um, the people that love Mill Creek Entertainment came in with these big, these public domain collections, these, yes. these, these big bricks of movies, and you get like 50 movies in one fell swoop. Yep. Um, and still, people, talk, like at least once a week, someone says, oh, I love, I love Mill Creek. I love those 50 movie packs. But you guys really have expanded so much since those days. Um, right. How much – can you just speak a little bit to that? Is that still – see, I see that these big movie packs are maybe a story from the past and not necessarily the present and the future. But you would know more than I would. Sure. Um, you know, it's it's funny. Like, So obviously that's kind of how Mill Creek got its initial footprint, right? Mm -hmm. They did tons of collections. And when we look back into the archives, you know, it was – Two packs, four packs, ten packs, twenty packs, fifty packs. That was that was literally the model. And and how many different ways can you repurpose the films and reorient them and um, and recategorize them? And um, and and it was it worked right. It was and they and Mill Creek got its success not by having these fifty packs at Walmart out the gate, right? It was non traditional retail. It was drugstores, grocery, and places that you wouldn't necessarily go to find entertainment, 
And here came this amazing value, value proposition. And it was still in the heyday of DVDs and no one was doing that kind of volume in terms of bulk and, and getting that kind of instant library. So, you know, we, we've continued to revamp that uh, 50 movie strategy. Um, I think even as soon as, I think it was four years ago, we kind of redid the entire lineup, added the plus digital component to it, just to have a unique point of differentiation. Um, Cause there's still, there's we know that there's still interest out there, but it's not like the well of films keeps growing exponentially, yeah. right? Like, so it's it's still remining and repurposing kind of the same bulk of content. Um, but I, but there's but there's new fans, right? And there's mm-hmm. and there's people whose DVD collections have had their ebbs and flows, and maybe they bought a collection like that 15 years ago, and maybe that's since gone away, or they've since moved, and but you know. But, times keep changing and people are falling back to the nostalgia of having a DVD and having physical media and are tired of all the streaming options that are out there and like to be able to just grab something right off their shelf and just be able to pop it in and enjoy it. So it's not completely out of the past, but it's, um, but it's something that we just dabble in it, but it's yeah. really hard to start fresh with a bunch of 50 movie collections, just, mm-hmm. just from a bandwidth issue of just how much it takes to reauthor them and reprepare them. And, you know, and they're, and they're a high cost of good. It's a, it's a heavy product. Yeah. Um, so, but we keep it in the back of our heads and we, and we, our public domain library is still an important part of our business. Um, but we, we try to slice and dice it a little bit differently um, and we do work with some collectors and those who have um, done a, like HD passes on select films. So we still look at that as options for how we can continue to grow that library a little bit. Gotcha. All right. Well, I, I do notice that. C- can you speak a little bit to how the model has changed just in the last few years? Because I feel like just the last two to three years, things have exploded um, all the retro TV on Blu-ray, and yeah. not even retro TV, modern TV. You guys, Twelve Monkeys. This is one of those yeah. new releases. It's a huge deal. Um, how have things changed, and and kind of maybe how have how 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 have they changed? Sure. Um, so I guess when we when Mill Creek first started getting into the license space, um, it was with TV. Uh, we had done um, a deal with uh, the Stephen J. Canal Library, so. They had all been at Anchor Bay or at Fox before, and they were reshopping their library to us. And we, we saw it as an opportunity because in the heyday, everything was super high priced. Um, and we thought there was a, a, a second time around that all of those products could have at a, at a more consumer friendly and mass price point. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what started our studio output deals, right? Like, so that's when Sony kind of came into the, into the fray, um, eventually Universal. And then when it came to TV, um, I think I think it, it happened at the same time that the streaming platforms are really starting to pick up on TV mm-hmm. and TV properties. And so the, the studios were kind of abandoning their home entertainment um, outlets for those properties. So they were happy to give them to us. And man, that was like, it was such a huge um, windfall for us because it's like, oh, okay, now our accounts and the people and the customers that we serve, we know that there's a, an appetite there. And so, yeah, you know, it started with Sony and like uh, Married with Children um, and Carsey Werner as well with like Roseanne and some of those TV series. So we just kind of got ourselves into a foothold where we knew the complete TV series was going to be a big deal. And so we've, we've really enjoyed that and Universal as well, like, uh, taking a show like 12 Monkeys, you know, we're like, we know that people want to own it in its entirety on Blu-ray. Mm-hmm. And even the Miami Vice and and Knight Rider and some of those other classics, I don't know, from a fan perspective, I wanted it, I'm Charlie's Angels. <laughs> you know, and, and some of it, some of the release and the success has been so, somewhat serendipitous with what's happening in pop culture, right? Yeah. Like we had licensed uh, Charlie's Angels years before the new Charlie's Angels movie came out, but we still held on to the rights. They had already done an HD pass for all the episodes for broadcast. And so it was like, okay, this is perfect timing to re- bring this back out 
and you know we obviously work very closely with the studio and so there's you know they gave us kind of a heads up that mm, movies are in the works and we're like okay great we'll start planning um uh, a blu-ray release as well you know because it benefits everybody yeah. obviously to to have those tie-ins um but yeah uh we we continue to look at what is available obviously music clearance is going to always be a huge issue for some tv series that mm -hmm. fans ask for um on a daily basis um <laughs> and, and so those are hurdles that we just can't overcome it's just right. not within our wheelhouse to do those clearances and if the studio's not willing to do it and pay for it it becomes very challenging for us to try to make that happen um, I think Shout Factory's had some really good success because they have that music uh, backbone to them. And so they they can do a little bit more, um, bringing like a show like The Nanny, right? We had a few seasons that were already cleared that were brought to us. They picked up and did the rest of the clearances so they could bring back the rest of the series. And so, you know, that's how even as competitive studios, uh, we, we still end up working together because it helps all of us, right? Mm -hmm. You know. And so we sub-license those, those uh, seasons to them, and they can bring it in and deliver what the fans are really looking for and, and what they really want. You keep talking about fans, and you talk about the collecting community. How much of a, of a factor does – I mean, it sounds like a lot – a factor that that plays into the decisions that are made behind the scenes? A ton. It really does. So the, the feedback drives future decisions. Absolutely. Or it's taken into account, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And we know that – some of our decisions are definitely for um, a mass audience, mm -hmm. and we will, tr and we know that. Um, but we also take the feedback, and that's why we will re-release something in a different way, in a different configuration, or a different package, or a different format, right. so that we can appease everybody, right? And sometimes yeah. we don't know until we make the announcement in one particular way that. You know, maybe it's a multi-feature and, and everyone's like, why did you pair these films together? Can you, <laughs> I really want this as a standalone. Um, and so we'll pivot. Uh, I think we did that. Uh, we took that into consideration with our September releases. Uh, we have the Jack Nicholson film, The Pledge. Uh -huh. And it was kind of like an initial read was, it was part of a, a bundle. And it was kind of like, oh, okay. Initial reads is suggesting that that deserves to be on its own, and, yeah. and so it just took a little bit more research on our side, and we're like, oh yeah, for sure, this does this belongs on its own. So we just did a quick pivot, and that's how we are releasing it in September. Every time you say pivot, I hear uh, Ross from Friends going pivot, 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 <laughs> pivot. Uh, maybe a good example for what you're kind of talking about is these VHS, like the retro VHS slipcover releases. These have been. Um, in my audience, I see a ton of positive feedback for them, and there's always like, people like, "When are when are more coming? Can you speak to the to these particular releases?" Yeah, absolutely. Um, that was a fun concept that we had been tossing around for a long time internally, and how we want to pitch and present. And then uh -huh. um, a retail promotion opportunity kind of came forward, and and we took it and we ran with it. And so. Um, and, and it finally just kind of everything fell together in, in the right way. It was the right timing of it. And it was the good way to continue to remind the titles that we had previously released in our catalog. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, as a video store junkie myself, I remember, that's how I remember these films. That's mm -hmm. how I remember discovering um, those films. And we really, I think in this day and age, with the digital platforms, the element of discovery is so... Is, is lost a little bit, right? Like it, mm -hmm. most of it's pushed in front of you, but I, I always harken back on the nostalgia of how I first came to know and love a particular film and it's back to the video store days. So Absolutely. being able to bring those out um, has been really exciting. Um, you know, we guess we will have future releases. We've kind of dabbled a little bit in the, like maybe, maybe we do a nineties edition, but I think the original, more 80s, you know, uh, approach has probably the, been the most successful and the best received thus yeah, far. Yeah, I don't have to tell you, but what the fans hate is like a new movie, like a 2018 <laughs> movie with a VHS slipcover. People are like, what? No. But like you said, like so many of these things, like this is the box, this is the box art we knew from the video stores. Like you'd go in and this is what jumped out at you. And I dig it because it gives you the best of both worlds. You know, you have, uh, well, this is the same, but yeah. a lot of these have alternate artwork underneath and you're like, I think Silent Rage has 
Uh, yeah, so yeah, slightly, you get you get like OG, and then you get uh, alternate. So yeah. I, I I think they're really cool, and they bring as you say they bring just like the freshness for the eye. They 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 jump out at you. We're talking a lot about like um, the physical experience, the retail store experience, yeah. um, and that's an experience that's changed in the last just this year with all the the, the global health stuff. Um, how right. much how much of a role does the physical store play in the current marketplace for you guys, at least. Um, it's still huge. It's still super important. And even in the last six months, we've seen growth in the category at the retailers that remained open. Um, I think everyone's still hungry for content. Yeah. And I don't think every consumer is completely ready to jump on all the digital options. There's, there's that tangibility that just doesn't seem to go away. Yeah. And so we will continue to support and provide. Um, and then a really unfortunate reality is that, you know, the major studios, when they don't have new releases in the theaters and they don't have new releases at retail or they're they're having to change their direction and, and, and go straight to retail. But I think it's their, their models built to go more straight to digital. So it's an opportunity in, in a little bit of ways for us to get some further placement at retail and continue to support retail in a bigger way. Mm -hmm. um, so we've we've had to get kind of creative and figure figure out what we can represent. Um, we put together some um, even our complete TVs. That's been a great category for us. So like we kind of pushed a bunch more of complete TV content out to to retail because we were like okay. If people are in stores, they don't want to be in stores for a very long time, and they would just want to pick up something that will offer a lot of consumption and, and time. So, I mean, that worked really well for us. Immediately um, in March, we were like, we need to push as much complete TV stuff as possible out to retail. And, you know, um, and then so far it's been working pretty well. But yeah, we, we were really dependent on, on, on brick and mortar retail um, still. You know, Best Buy being closed for as long as it was, that was that was tough, right? That's, mm -hmm. that's a huge piece in the marketplace where, especially our collector's uh, titles, um, Ultraman and the like, you know, that that's always, that was always a very reliable home for those. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I, you know, they're reopening and everything's starting to pick back up. But the Walmarts and the Targets and Dollar Generals uh, of the world that continue to stay open are remaining essential businesses. Um, the the physical media sales are still holding out strong. So we've been really fortunate in that regard. Mm -hmm. You played a pretty crucial role in um, forging some relationships, like getting product into those stores, didn't you? Walmart, Target, Best yeah. Buy. Yeah. That was a big point of differentiation that Mill Creek's always had, is the power of retail relationships. And, you know, in the, I'd say probably the, or, I don't know, probably 20 10 to 2012, the, the scan-based trading business model um, wasn't really, didn't really exist in the home entertainment space. And it was something that we brought to the table and offered as a solution for, re for retailers to not have to own all that inventory and, and be wholly responsible for all that inventory. Mm -hmm. And it, it was a really smart business decision that the owners of Mill Creek did. And again, it, in this to be an indie studio in amidst, especially during that time, we had to do something different. We had to do something innovative and had to um, be creative in how we are gonna continue to support the physical business mm -hmm. because it's obviously been on a decline um you know nationally for 10 years but we've managed to stay strong and, and keep keep growing and finding new business models mm -hmm. um, but so yeah so retail support has been a, a pretty much a principal goal and mantra for mill creek uh from the beginning and and then finding all the products that support that and i'd say to the point that you brought up earlier you know catering to the fans it's always been in the back of our minds but I think the last five years have really been allowing us to to flourish and explore that further as as the dot coms have got a lot more diversified and and have opened up the the gates to potential of how we brand and market ourselves as well as our products. Um, so it's allowed us you know greater creativity and greater freedom to produce the products that are mutually beneficial to both fans and retailers. 
Excellent. That seems like a good uh, a lead into a question that we got from Patreon. Some of the uh, Serial at Midnight Patreon supporters submitted a few questions. Dave wanted to know, uh, can you tell, if there, tell us if there are any plans to further expand and develop Mill Creek Entertainment's digital footprint or if physical media remains the primary focus? Um, yes. Uh, we will always continue to find a digital you know, placement where we can. Um, but most of our studio relationships don't offer a digital component. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, where we do excel is a lot of our own original content. Um, it's probably not as as well known, but Mill Creek's been producing original content um, pretty much, well, the entire time I've been here. Um, and we do it with other producing partners. So they don't all, you know, it's not us with cameras in our hands per, per se. But that that original IP is where we've really had the chance to flourish in the digital space. Um, we started probably six years ago. We developed a few of our own channels. We had an America's Wars uh, War subscription channel. We did a martial arts channel. We did a fitness channel. And those were really good. Those were our first forays into the digital space in a big way. Mm-hmm. We've always had t- content on iTunes and, and Amazon and, and Google and the like, um, wherever we can. And you know, I think the learnings from those individual channels brought us to our first uh, digital Mill Creek Ent, our Watch Mill Creek Ent channel that we had. That was when we first introduced our own digital redemptions onto our products. And then that evolution kind of changed into Movie Spree. Um, so that's our transactional video platform. Um, we're, we're continuing to find new avenues to grow that. We're looking at other monetization models, um, introducing an AVOD component to that, hopefully. Um, we recently just enabled rentals and are going to continue to expand that. So we know it's a super important thing to have a foothold, but it's also a very noisy and crowded space to compete with. So we kind of have to be really humble and know who we are and 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 what people are seeking. So, mm-hmm. you know, when it comes to the kind of, kind of content, um, we'll take whatever we can get and we'll push out wherever we can. Um, but, you know, there's there's a lot of, hmm, there's lots of, I mean, there's we've always had a digital foothold, if you will, uh, but Movie Spree's kind of been our answer to kind of a catch-all of like, all right, here we go. Let's, let's start pooling all of our assets together you know, the digital redemptions that we can offer on our products, we've chosen to keep that kind of within our wheelhouse and as opposed to being part of the movies anywhere. Um, it's it's not an ideal scenario for a lot of fans and consumers. We realize that, but the barrier to entry um, and is it's tough. We can't, we couldn't continue to offer the kind of, of value um, that we pride ourselves in being able to put into our products if we're going to embark on that strategy. Yeah. So, kind of keep it all in our wheelhouse and do the best we can to provide a, a an immersive experience and and so kind of happy. speaking of value and uh and and that's trying to you know make the most that you can with with the resources available uh this question comes from robert mill creek entertainment has had a history of experimenting with packaging over the years to varying results <laughs> what are your thoughts on the criticisms of the packaging uh and um how has that influenced the packaging decisions of today sure it's a very great question and one that we fielded a lot so i'll, I'll tell the origins of of why we've chosen the packaging we've gone to there was a time when when um, plastic and the big plastic cases um, it was a it was a proprietary mold for our first mega packs that had that the paper sleeves and the well and while everyone liked the plastic case people didn't necessarily like that we had to put our discs in paper sleeves mm-hmm. but it was a custom mold and we had it for a really diverse product line and then what was it probably 2012 2013 um there were all the port strikes and those were being produced in china and suddenly we couldn't get our cases to come to into the u.s and we had two consecutive holidays um where we had case shortages and we couldn't ship product to retail and so we decided to make a fundamental shift to try to go away from plastics because at that time anyways, there wasn't a viable domestic solution and we were tired of having our 
products kind of hung up because of because of the case situation. Mm-hmm. So we've gone through multiple, and I mean multiple, um, trying to get creative and trying to be resourceful and trying to be economical uh, solutions. And so where we had landed was the corrugate uh, box and and the paper sleeves that hold the discs. Um, you know, there is criticism, but there has been praise. There are a number of efficiencies with just having print and paper versus plastic. Um, there is, um, I know it's not always ideal, but we honestly have far fewer shakers and loose discs in that configuration than we do with anything that's hubbed. Um, and and they're slim. They take up a little bit less shelf space. You can get more discs in, in per inch, which means that per box there's fewer or there's more products, which means that your freight mm-hmm. and your your streamlineness of, of being able to provide to retailers. So I know it's a controversial subject and that's why when, when it comes to our Blu-ray and our and our Blu-ray products, we've we've really tried to find plastic case solutions. Yep. So that, you know, again it's it's a it's a casual fan versus um, a hardcore fan. So we try to again Always, we try to balance both and appease everybody. Um, but yeah, I know we're well aware of, of the struggles <laughs> and the challenges that exist. But most of our most of our um, DVD sets that are in the cardboard, we've gone to a hard corrugate um, mm-hmm. option. So a lot of them have transitioned, and there's there's mixed inventory in the marketplace, which is also challenging. Um, but we've we've tried to continue to improve upon that so that the crush factor um, doesn't become quite such an issue anymore. And yeah, so apologies yeah. for those who are frustrated by it, but there are so many business factors at play in those decisions. And and there was yeah there were some fundamental reasons why we tried to stray away from the big plastic cases as much as possible. That spearheaded right. all of it. I appreciate that answer. Um, yeah. Uh, you've kind of we've touched on this one, but I'm going to ask this. Gary wants to know uh, what factors besides sales do you consider when bringing new products to to market, it, such as like what is the competitive, you know, like what's the competitor uh, landscape like? What what are some of the things that you think about? And you kind of answered it, but uh, go ahead. No, um, you know, we try to take a like we try to take a look at is this relevant now, right? Like. Is there an anniversary at play? Are the are, are the people are the cast in it going to be appearing in something big? Um, you know, we're, we try to try to capitalize on and, and get some drafting opportunities whenever they make sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so that kind of comes into more of the timing, uh, I guess, what it, of of when we bring things to market. Um, but when we're pursuing, like a lot of our deals are library deals, so we, it's it's less going to a studio and saying, we want one film, we want these two films. It's more like 50, 100, or in some cases, uh, close to 500 at a time. And in, in making those decisions, we, we look at a ton of different factors. We look at, um, you know, one, can it be brought to a new format? So can we introduce it on Blu-ray? Um, and that involves going back to the sources and asking if HD elements exist or if HD ready materials are, are available for us to do those transfers. Um, we look at past performance, obviously, on, on if it was previously released on DVD, how well did it do? Can we make some broad strokes assumptions of where it got placed or at what price point it's been placed at? Um, how long has it been out of the market? Uh, is a huge one. Um, in some of our recent, uh, you know, we we did a, a license deal with uh, of films from Morgan Creek Entertainment, and so like going back and looking at those, most of them have been largely out of the marketplace for a considerable amount of time. So bringing not only bringing them back out, but bringing them back out on an up on an upgraded format seemed to make a lot of sense. So you know, culling through those lists and trying to identify exactly what um, what we think that the, the is is ready for a reappearance, I guess, is is part yeah. of our processes. And then, like I said before, scouring forums and looking at, um, you know, wish lists of what what fans want to see either have never made it on DVD or ha- haven't made a Blu-ray upgrade yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
we have running lists all over our building and 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 as well as just garnering the feedback from our own staff mm-hmm. you know like what do you want to see what have you what you know what films have you loved that was a recent exercise we did um and looking at a, a future film deal i like sent the list out to everyone i was like all right i want everyone to just highlight what you think what, what you love what you remember what you'd love to see and you know everyone's got a really valuable opinion and you know we're all in the you know we're all in this business together and we're all looking through and walking it around retail uh obviously keeping tabs of what's happening on amazon and uh, on the blu-ray.com forums so you know we, we take the input from everyone on our team um because we know that you know what i might not know or be completely familiar with the next person might have yeah just an equal amount of affinity for her, so very cool yeah uh, it, this is the last question, but it's a question in three parts. And then also before I let you go, we do have to talk about Ultraman because we Ultraman do. is like this giant, both physically and <laughs> <laughs> metaphorically, <laughs> representatively. Uh, Will wants to know: Are there plans to release more complete series of cla- series is, is, is of classic television shows on Blu-ray? Yeah. Okay. Um, will there be any new additions to the retro VHS slipcover line? We've you said that those Definitely. were coming. Uh, and the last one, are there any plans to include more special features in future releases? Yeah. So um, I'll start with the classic TV on Blu-ray. That, of course, is dependent on assets and availability and if an HD transfer exists. So that's tough, right? I mean, that's... Mm-hmm. I think... I mean, we've even seen the major studios bringing out as iconic of classics as I Love Lucy that never get the full complete series treatment, right? Yeah. I mean, it is it, it's it is an endeavor to to go back at those old ones and do that kind of restoration. So again, for those scenarios, we're really dependent on it the studio um, that we're working with and licensing from. If they have an appetite to to undergo that, and it becomes and oftentimes we do work together and have those conversations together. Like they gauge our interest, we gauge their interest. And if it all comes together, it makes sense. Charlie's Angels is a primary example of mm-hmm. that, right? There's definitely a broadcast want and need and demand for it. There was a home home video element and demand for it. So that all came together in a time when, you know, the, the franchise was being reintroduced to audiences. So that's a tricky one. Um, there are a few that are on our a perspective roadmap um but it is again that well uh <laughs> yeah it, it, it's hit or miss so mm-hmm. um people are we love seeing suggestions but we also um know that you know things shot on tape in the in the 70s and 80s and 90s um we don't want to do an, an untrue hd upgrade like right like we want to make sure mm-hmm. that it's 1080 scan and it's a true HD versus a, a standard def upgrade, which yeah. we do not want to do. So really dependent on whatever sources are available. Mm-hmm. Um, retro TV, yes. Uh, or Sorry, retro VHS, yes. There's definitely a plan to continue rolling that out. Again, um, our library is huge, so we're willing to take suggestions um, on, on what people are looking for. And if there's any points of differentiation uh, that that people would like to see in the way that we package that, totally open to it. And um, what was the third one? Uh, third one was. Oh, pull special it back features. Up here. Yeah, oh. it's been new, new special. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this year, especially, I think we've we've. So there's been a balance between um, acquiring uh, special features that have already been on previous home entertainment releases, mm-hmm. um, which we we want to do as much as possible. Uh, it does involve a complete redo of clearances from the studio level. So that's why not everything always makes it over. But then when it comes to new special features, um, we've, we've had some new partnerships and, and have been working with some groups uh, to, to produce those in a way that's both, I think, interesting and engaging to, to the, the fans and, and makes financial sense for us to do. You know, mm-hmm. um, We don't necessarily have those uh, capabilities in-house, so we always have to work with an outside group to, to facilitate. Um, but we're, um, there's an, actually an announcement going out later today 
of some other uh, special features that are being added to a, an upcoming release. Uh, so, so yeah, if we're going to continue to do that wherever it makes sense. I checked my inbox really quick. <laughs> like, did it come through? <laughs> It'll. I have a draft of it. It'll go out later today. I think I know what it is, but I, I'll I'll wait for the announcement. No, it's for Inner Sanctum. That's um, what I that's what I was suspecting. Yeah, the uh, the documentary stuff that's coming out from yeah. um, Ballyhoo, right? Is that who? Yeah. yeah. They've been a great partner in, you know, the classic horror and, and the Universal Monsters universe is, is a perfect fit for them. Um, so, yeah, we're just continuing to find those who have, uh, you know, have an inherent knowledge or a fandom already exists and we can work together to produce those that make sense. And Ballyhoo Films is one of the best. Uh, they're one of the best people, uh, the best creators of that content they do a fantastic job so really excited about that that release is going to be stellar i can't wait of course we'll be talking about it at serial at midnight yep. um real quick i know we're going longer than we had planned um right. ultraman we got to talk about ultraman, ultraman uh, it's been about a year since the news first started to come out right it was last summer if i believe if yep, it was correct. last ultraman day is when we made the big announcement made the big splash and then the re- first releases just came out just last october yeah um and in that yeah. time, we got five Showa era series. <laughs> We've got three so far. We got Ultraman Orb, Geed. No, I'm sorry, Geed. Yeah, I've watched the whole thing, and I still call it Geed, but it's Geed. Yeah. Um, X. We got RB coming. Um, how how is that going? Like, it seems like it's huge. You guys put out so much Ultraman. Right. It's it's fun. I mean, it it's it's a freight train, right? We want to keep the momentum <laughs> yeah. going and. Um, you know, it's it, it's not easy. It's very complicated, right? There's so many components to putting it together, um, so much checking. Uh, and but you know, I, I think what I'm, we're most proud of is the fact that we're being able to reintroduce this entire franchise and, and trying to and build a bigger following and, and, and attract a new audience. And so a lot of the sensibilities that we that we've had in you know, even going back as far as He-Man, right? Like bringing bringing this back and 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 exposing the the, the familiar brand to new audiences and to those who have loved it forever. Um, it, it's it's again a labor of love. And you know, when we have a steelbook version and a standard Blu-ray version, we have to figure out what why people would want one or the other, or would they want both? And, and, and what can we do differently and unique to, to serve both of those customer bases? Mm-hmm. Um, there's obviously, you know, our strategy was kind of a bookended approach. Start with the oldest and the, and the classics and release them. Start with the, some of the newer series and bring them back. And most of that's because of the format um, and the HD availability of the assets. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a sizable group of, of titles that were, um, you know, uh, mid 90s to early 2000s where hd elements don't exist and we fully can will continue to support and release those so that there is one day a, an entire shelf behind you that's devoted solely to the ultraman uh library um but yeah it's a it's a fascinating and and just a it's a real fun series to work on mm-hmm. and I, I i it's safe to say that this is not it, right? Look, what we've done thus far is not what, not the totality of how we intend to release and continue to treat this franchise. Um, the Ultraman Day exclusive, The Birth of Ultraman, was just kind of a, a hint and a preview of how we can want to continue to 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 take and treat the the franchise and have more diverse releases that are have greater appeal. Um, English dubs. Um, is is an ongoing search and an ongoing um, pursuit to to obtain. Um, it's also very challenging, but there are plenty of conversations happening on how we can potentially um, re-release and reimagine everything mm-hmm. Um, with, mm-hmm. with all these appeals. So we're not done. We've got a well, lot more to come. I appreciate that. You guys have done a great job with it. The involvement of Keith Aiken over from Sci-Fi Japan, um, from the fans. Thank you guys for putting these out. I, I also, you mentioned He-Man, and I have to, I have to ask. Uh, these He-Man releases, I mean, they're over my shoulder in every single video, and they line up to create oh, a yeah. spine mural and Ultraman. These releases line up to create a mural. 
uh, coincidence or is that uh um, not at all <laughs> very intentional um so our creative director here at mill creek dan whelan has been with jeff and i even back in the bci days so nice. we've we yeah we've, we've we've taken a lot of the learnings and sensibilities over the years and wanted to reapply them and so when when we were trying to figure out this the, what we what we're considering our standard blu-ray releases um a unique point of differentiation for them it was like oh spy mural for sure let's keep that going um, let's do that because we, you know we love geeking out on that kind of stuff too. We love seeing that art um, presented in a really creative and imaginative way, and you know, and it just the, the blend that you can get and 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 seeing things as you've never been able to see them before, uh, a fully integrated uh, vision of of how these um, series that have such a through line anyway um, can all kind of seamlessly blend together. That's that was always the grand vision. So. I even love that Ultra Q, which is black and white, the logo is black instead of the red. It's these little touches, you know, these little collector-friendly touches. So well done. So um, on behalf of the collector community, thank you guys for all that you're doing. Guys, uh, Barrett Evans, tell tell people, plug away, tell people where they can, this is your opportunity to just plug, plug, plug. <laughs> no, um, you know, um, for all of our content, we try to put all of our announcements right on our Mill Creek Camp website. So by all means, visit there. Um, looking for our products, you know, always rely on Amazon and deep discount. Always, always, always have all of our content. Um, deep discount has a, a Ultraman sub page where you can guarantee to find all of our Ultraman products. So be sure to check, click on there. Um, but otherwise, just kind of stay tuned. Follow us on all of our social profiles. Um, you know, uh, we, we love engagement with the with the fans as much as we can, um, you know, but we are a very small team. So we, we do the best to <laughs> respond as yeah. best we can. But we really appreciate your support. We appreciate the fan support. Um, like I said, this is this is all a labor of love for us because we really, truly love this kind of content and bringing it back out to retail. So we're opening the floodgates to suggestions and ideas for 2021 and um yeah really appreciate it Heath. i i really appreciate you thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us here this is a big deal i i appreciate that you did it um <laughs> guys barrett evans mill creek entertainment thank you so much for taking the time guys thank you for watching this video and until next time i will catch you later